Hello, and welcome to the Capitola City Council meeting. In accordance with the current Santa Cruz County Health Order and the Governor's Executive Order N-2920, this meeting is not physically open to the public. Council and staff are meeting via Zoom, and there are several ways for the public to watch and participate. Information on how to join the meeting over Zoom or with your phone is available on our website, cityofcapitola.org, on the slides now shown, and on the published meeting agenda. Thank you for attending this Capitola City Council meeting. Mayor Peterson, I'll turn to you to call the meeting to order. Thank you, Chloe. We're now gonna to call tonight's meeting to order. Uh, can we have a roll call, please? Yes. Council Member Bertrand. Here. Council Member Botorf. Here. Council Member Story. Here. Vice Mayor Brooks. Here. Mayor Peterson. Here. Thank you. Uh, we're now going to do the Pledge of Allegiance. If I could ask all the council members to mute themselves. And if Vice Mayor Brooks could lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Absolutely. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to its republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We can move on to a report on closed session. Uh, we, the council met in closed session about the two agendized items, and in both cases, uh, no action was taken. Thank you. We're going to move on now to item three, presentation. And we're going to uh, have one presentation tonight, a retirement procla proclamation for Ben Iro. And I would like to uh, read our proclamation for this evening. We are honoring parking officer Ben Iro upon his retirement for 35 years of service to our city. Remarkable, 35 years. Whereas parking officer Ben Iro began his career with the city of Capitola Police Department in April of 1985 and officially retired on October 28, 2020, after 35 years of outstanding service to the residents of Capitola. And whereas Parking Officer Iro has selflessly, selflessly supported the Northern California Special Olympics with annual fundraising efforts and participated in the Law Enforcement Torch Run, which is the largest public awareness campaign for Special Olympics. And whereas during his tenure as parking officer, Ben Iro quickly became a favorite member of the police department family appreciated for his infectious smile and sense of humor. And whereas Ben Ira was well known about Capitola Village and the larger city as a valued positive ambassador between the public and the city of Capitola. And whereas parking officer Ira's calm demeanor and dedication to his community will be missed by all of Capitola Police Department and the city of Capitola. And whereas Parking Officer Iro is deeply devoted and active with the local Twin Lakes Community Church where he participates in youth programs and counseling. And now, therefore, I, Kristen Peterson, Mayor of the City of Capitola, on behalf of the City Council, City staff, and the entire Capitola community, do hereby commend and thank Ben Iro for more than three decades of excellence and devoted service. Thank you so very much, Officer Iro. You have committed more time to this service than I have been alive on this earth. And it is an incredible, so, such an incredible uh, accomplishment and we are so grateful for all of your service. Thank you, thank you so much. If you have anything to say, please, please, uh, any any words. Well, at this time, I just want to thank uh, the city and Capitola Police Department for allowing me the privilege to serve this fine city. It's been a privilege, it's been an honor, and I am so grateful for the relationships that I've developed over 
the many years that I've been here, and I would not ever trade up for anything else. I am so grateful, and for that, I feel like a very wealthy man. I thank you so much. Thank you. One more round of applause. Virtual round of applause. <laughs> Uh, Baron Peterson, can I make a comment, please? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, Baron, I'm going to keep it short because I don't want to bore you. I know you're a man of many facts, but I want to thank you for all your years of service, and I wish you and Elaine a very happy and wonderful retirement. Thank you both for being part of our community. Thank you so much for letting allow us to be a part thank of this community. You. We will always be a part of this community. Yeah. And, Mayor, if I may, um, Dan, congratulations on your retirement. And I'm, I just want to tell you, you know, the Capitola and especially the village is not going to be the same without seeing you uh, around town uh, over these many decades. Um, I've really come to, um, you know, appreciate the work that you've done, uh, your professional career that you've given to the city. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and the best of luck to you and the best of health in your retirement. So thank you. I would just like to add, Ben, congratulations. Um, I, I echo everything the rest of our council has said this evening. You will definitely be missed, but enjoy your retirement. It's well-deserved. Thank you so much. Absolutely, well-deserved retirement. And I, I think uh, if, I could, if I could just say, I believe that when I was a child, I may have met you a very long time ago because I, I believe that my, uh, my grandpa introduced me to you uh, and said, this is, this is Ben Jammin. And that's, uh, right. that's how he called me. Yeah, yeah and that's, what I, that's how I met you. So uh, well-deserved retirement. Thank you so much for your service. Thank you, ma'am. All right. We are going to uh, move on now to item number four, additional materials. Are there additional materials for tonight's agenda? Yes, there were two additional materials. One um, was sent out regarding item 8D and another regarding item 8G earlier this week. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to item five. Are there any additions or deletions to tonight's agenda? Council has no changes to the agenda for this evening. Thank you. We'll move on now to public comment. This is the time for any members of the public to address the council on items that are not on tonight's agenda. And I will turn it over to our moderator to determine if there's any uh, public comments tonight. Thank you, Thank you Mary Peterson. I do not see any hands raised, and I do not see any emails on public comment. All right. Thank you very much. With that, we will close public comment and move on to city council and staff comments. And we'll start with staff. Do any staff members have comments this evening? I think we have two items this evening from uh, Public Works Director Jesper. Great. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I just want to make sure everybody is aware that on Monday we are having a virtual workshop on the risk and management project. It will be starting at six o'clock, and that there is an announcement on the uh, on our web homepage if anybody wants information, or they can call the public works department. The second item is just an update on the jetty project. I know last council meeting I said it was going to be starting this week. Um, the contractor is kind of re-looking at the tides and finding out, uh, trying to pick a better time for him to start. We need to work when we can get to the lowest tides. Right now, they are earmarking starting on November 30th. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Uh, we will move on, oh, I'm sorry. Is there any uh, members of the council that have any items or comments tonight? And I see that council member Bertrand has his hand up. Well, I just wanted to say I walk by the uh, library uh, a couple times a week, maybe three or four times a week, and it's so nice to see the work progressing. Um, I take a picture almost each time, and um, it's just really turning out to be a beautiful project. 
And uh, thank you, Steve, and everyone else on the staff that's working on pushing this and making sure we're on, well, <laughs> forget the schedule. Just as long as we're getting it complete, I'm just very happy to see it going. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member Bertrand. Uh, Vice Mayor Brooks. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to let everyone know as we um, enter into the holiday season, the Second Harvest Food Bank um, is currently looking for volunteers to help distribute food. Um, so if you know of anyone or um, want some more information on how to sign up, you can feel free to reach out to me um, via email. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Vice Mayor Brooks. I don't see any other council members uh, with their hands up. So I will just uh, say for my public comment, uh, one, to, to echo what council member Bertrand had said, I'm really excited for the library. It looks amazing. Um, for anyone who's on Facebook, you know that they sometimes show you memories, things that you've posted in years past. And I recently uh, was reminded of the memory in 2018 of the groundbreaking. And so I'm very much looking forward to the completion of this project. Um, and the other thing I'd like to state is that, as we know, um, the county has seen a spike in COVID cases, and those cases have been related back to gatherings for uh, Halloween. And as we come up on Thanksgiving and Christmas, um, the guidance that we've seen from the, from the county and the state is to uh, ensure that no more than three households are gathering at a time, and that it's best if those gatherings are outdoors. And I hope that we will all take that into consideration as we do our best to try to um, slow this spike of, of cases that we've seen recently. With that, and seeing no other comments from council, uh, we will move on to item eight, which is the consent calendar. All items on the consent calendar will be enacted by one motion in the form listed on the agenda, and there will be no separate discussion uh, on these items unless a member of the public or a member of the council would like to pull an item for separate consideration. So I see uh, if Larry can confirm, I see no member of the public that wants to pull an item for separate consideration. Is that the case? Yes, Yes. I, I do not see anybody in the audience with their hand up, Mayor Peterson. Okay, thank you. With that, we'll come back to council. I see council member Botworth has his hand up. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, please, the Mayor, I would like to pull item 8G for discussion. Okay. 8G is holiday suspension of the village parking fees. Um, do we have, just for the sake of determining if we should uh, take this right away or, or add this item to our general government, um, can staff let us know if, uh, from their awareness if, if there's anyone from the BIA on the call this evening? Or if, or if someone from the BIA could raise their hand if they're on the call and have um, comments on this item? Mayor Peterson, this is Larry. I do see someone from the BIA in attendance. Oh, Rodney. Okay, then let's go ahead and pass the rest of, um, of our consent calendar right now. And then before we move on to general government, we will, um, we will move on to item G so that members of the BIA can weigh in before we move on. I'll make a motion to approve the consent calendar barring item 8G. I'll second that motion. All right, we have a motion from Council Member Botworth and a second by Council Member Bertrand. Uh, can we have a roll call vote, please? Thank you. Council Member Bertrand. I approve. Council Member Botworth. Aye. Council Member Story. Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. And Mayor Peterson. Aye. Thank you. Uh, we will now consider item 8G from, was pulled from the consent calendar, uh, holiday suspension of village parking fees. And I will start by asking Council Member Bator for comments uh, on his decision to pull this item and then we'll move forward from there. Would you like a oh. short staff presentation to introduce the item? Sure. Well, well, we that. Sure, thank you. Galley, are you available? Yes. Great. How about it? Perfect. Um, I don't know if everyone can hear hear me, but uh, but hold on here. All right. Good evening, uh, Mayor Peterson and Council. Uh, I'll give you a quick quick background. What we're talking about is uh, 
the holiday suspension for village parking essentially since 2001, with the exception of one year in 2003, uh, with at the request of the either the chamber or the BIA, um, they've requested that um, suspend parking meter um, payment through uh, only in the village area from Thanksgiving through December. So essentially, it's from November 26th through December 25th. Uh, it suspends the uh, meter and pay station payment, but it does not suspend the three hour turnover time. And that's what's on the agenda. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Council Member Bottorf, do you have any uh, questions about this before we, uh, we can bring it to public comment for our BIA members, or would you like to wait until we hear from them and then come back? I have no questions, Mayor, thank you. Okay, um, I will turn it over to our moderator for a comment on this item. Yes, yes I do see someone in the audience, uh, Rodney with his hand up, so I will allow to talk. Hello, this is Rodney with the Capitol of BIA. Um, the board did vote on this and almost unanimous unanimously uh, voted in favor of the free parking. They felt it did benefit business and um, it was something that a lot of locals were looking forward to. We do know there's a huge loss to the city and there has been because of the outdoor dining and we'll respect any decision you guys make. Thank you, Rodney. Larry, I'll turn it back to you. It looks like we might have one more public comment. Yes. Hey guys, thanks so much for listening. Um, I also agree with the BIA. Um, I have been a long-term employee of the village. And while I realize that the parking has been taken up via the Esplanade dining experience that we are now allowed to have, which has also helped our small businesses prosper. I think that um, people are deterred from Capitola due to the parking. And I think if we can do some sort of incentive, whether that's, hey, buy an hour, get two free or whatever, if we can make some sort of maybe compromise on the matter, that could also help. Um, but I think that going forward through the holidays to help the small businesses and small shops move forward during this time along with the restaurants. Um, I think it would be a good idea to keep it in mind. Um, I realize we have taken a cut, so I understand if that's not in the budget, it's not in the budget, but I think it's definitely something to consider and um, I totally am down with that. And obviously if not, then that's okay too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any additional comments? I will ask our uh, moderator. I'm not sure if it was a, um, a sound issue on my end or if you're muted there. I think you said there was nothing more, correct? I, I do not see any more comments. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, then we'll bring it back uh, to consider to continue considering item 8G. Uh, and I will bring it back to Council Member Bottorf who pulled this item. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this, you know, I, I think um, the way I'd like to begin this is, uh, you know, I, I've been a big fan of this program ever since its inception. I think that the city has, has always in years past taken the position uh, to, to do anything possible to help the, the village merchants. And we've demonstrated that by the long run that uh, Captain Daly shared with us uh, of how long we've been doing this. Uh, with that being said, this is a different situation. It's 2020 and it's COVID. And COVID has been devastating the city of Capitola's budget. Uh, I think we've gone over all the numbers. Uh, we've, we've been making cuts to approximately $2.75 mil $2 million of the same that we always took for granted and we just can't afford. I'm a little uh, surprised that the fact that the city manager put this on the consent agenda based on the, on the discussions that we've had and how diligently this council has worked 
to make every cut possible to things that we never thought we would cut. Uh, I also am a little disappointed in, in uh, not disappointed, but I'm concerned about the council moving forward. Uh, when I watched the council forum for candidates talking about what was the number one issue in Capitola, it was about how we were going to survive a $2.75 million deficit and what cuts would be made, the necessary to be made to get us through that. And I think that when we come here now, we look at something that is just like the parking, uh, this is an actual $30,000 loss to the city. And I think that we struggle, uh, you know, we, 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 in times past, maybe have not paid attention to $30,000. But I'm gonna tell you that, you know, when it comes to situations, you can think that 50,000 doesn't matter. And then it becomes 500,000. And in the case of the library, it becomes $1.5 million that we took out of the general fund for a shortfall. And I'm sure we could all use that $1.5 million right now, as much as we love this library, it's real dollars. And, and the other comment is, is that, you know, I, I, I think that it's really important that we remember some, some, some uh, actions we've already taken. We've laid off employees. We've cut employees' salary. We, we've taken away COLA. And I, I think that, you know, a, a lesson I learned at a recent negotiation I was involved in was a Santa Cruz City Council person said something that rang true with me, and that it is cities should not get in the habit of balancing the budget on the backs of employees. And I think there's a lesson there because another thing we did as a group unanimously is we took $275,000 away from community grants. And my fear is, is that I love the parking program, but I also know that in actuality, a lot of those parking places go to surfers and employees. And we've already committed to 47 parking places where we're losing approximately $132,000 to support these businesses to allow them to move outside so they can make a living. And I don't begrudge that. I think this council made a tough decision to waive all fees, waive all permits, and we're losing 100, by the time this is done, because I believe this is gonna go well into July of next year, it will be about $150,000 we will have lost to support those businesses. So this shouldn't be like we're trying to not help our businesses. We definitely have shown that. But I just think this is a little icing on the cake or maybe a little salt in the wound. I think this is something where I also believe that if the surfers take those places and the employees take those places and we've given 47 places to the, to the, to the restaurants, there's not gonna be places for these customers to park. And I think what's really gonna upset a customer is if he comes into town and he's gotta hike up to the upper village because there's 52 surfboards parked in, in the village where he can't get to the store. So I think this is a common sense decision I think it's something that I absolutely hope that next year when this all returns to normal, that you return this to the BIA because I think one of their concerns was that we always wanted to take it away and that's not the case. This is something that I, I believe we all support, but I think right now these are difficult times and it calls for difficult decisions. And trust me, you're gonna continue next year to have to make difficult decisions over and over again to balance the $2.75 million deficit. So with that, I'm prepared to make a motion to not approve uh, holiday parking for this year. Okay, we have a motion on uh, item 8G. Do we have a second? I'll second, Mayor Peterson. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, we'll continue for discussion. Are there any other comments on this item? Or questions? I have a question, um, Madam Mayor. Sure. Yeah, in terms of um, employees parking down at the Esplanade and surfers parking down at the Esplanade, um, my question to staff is would it make much difference if there's charging for the meters or not charging for the meters? Because my understanding is they have permits to do that. That's my question to staff. 
No, I refer the question to Captain Daly. I think he's still on the call this evening about the experience during the free parking period about seeing an uptick in um, employee parking in the village. Sure. Um, so as far as the surfers occupying those spots, I mean, they, we do have the surfer and coffee permits that we issue out, and those are for the morning hours. Um, but other than that, the, the only employee parking that we have is for the PAC code lots, so it does not impact that. But when we do have the um, free parking in there, um, and people do take advantage of those spots down there as far as employees or, or uh, yeah, employees of, of businesses down there, they do take up those, those parking spots. They do, okay. Um, Madam Mayor, if I could ask and follow up a question to the captain. So uh, in terms of the PAC Cove uh, program, um, has that expanded to all the employees? I mean, I knew that was just covering some that chose to do it. So, and you sort of answered it recently. I, I just want to know um, some of the permits, as far as I know, still allows employees to park downtown in front of the Esplanade businesses they work at. Yeah, the, the, so they do, all employees have access to those, through their employers, they get the code and then they can buy the the, per, the monthly permits to park in the PAC code lots. Just and, the PAC code, okay. Correct, or the beach and village parking lot. And, okay. Hmm. Okay, so, you know, I agree with uh, Ed in terms of um, having too many employees parking in front of the businesses, it seems to sort of work against the businesses if their employees are parking there. Uh, maybe that's part of the issue we should address. So that, that's just a comment. Okay. Are there any additional questions on this item? Okay. Um, I, I just want to make a comment uh, briefly. I do want to acknowledge um, one, that um, I, I understand your concerns, Council Member Bosworth, um, and I'm, I'm kind of at a, um, it, it's, well, I want to acknowledge your concerns, and I first want to let you know that it was not the city manager that put this on the consent calendar. This, that was my decision, only because it's always been on, this, on the consent calendar, and I felt that if anyone felt the need to pull it, that they would, and so it's completely, you know, within your right to do so. So I do want to acknowledge that, that that was my decision to do so. Um, I understand the concern. I also feel that our village businesses have suffered a great deal uh, in this year, and we've seen several of our businesses close down completely. And as we go into the winter months and there's gonna be the cold uh, weather and uh, the COVID restrictions, and as I mentioned before, our COVID cases are rising, so we may even find ourselves sliding back into more restrictive tiers, that I'm concerned about what this means for the economic vitality of our village and so I'm not, I'm not prepared to entirely uh, decline this, but I am wondering, Council Member Bator, if you're willing for some kind of, um, um, some kind of in-between, whereas we're not entirely getting rid of the suspension of village parking fees, but perhaps moving it back a week. So instead of having an entire month, would you be more comfortable with three weeks or two weeks of suspending the parking fees so that we still allow, um, our, our, our village businesses to have a couple weeks where people are more likely to be spending more time in the village and in our businesses. And I'm interested in your thoughts on that if you're willing to, to have that discussion. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I, I'm happy to comment to that. I, I just wanted to, think, I, I wanted to make sure that I wasn't gonna allow any other council person to comment before I did. So if, if nobody else wants to make a comment, then I would be happy to address your, 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 your discussion. Sure, thank you. I do see that Vice Mayor Brooks has her hand up. Uh, Council Member Tron and Council Member Bator, if you both still have your hands up, so if you could take them down so that as we move forward, I know who's, who's reaching out for new comments. So I'm gonna move it over to uh, Vice Mayor Brooks now and we'll keep the conversation going. Thank you, Mayor Peterson. Um, it just in, in response to your comment about securing and supporting the economic vitality of our businesses. My concern is that if we can't support the economic vitality of our city from the beginning, from the get-go here, we're gonna be in trouble. We won't be able then to really support any of our businesses further. We wouldn't be able to do the things we do if we can't support just the fundamentals of our city 
and our staff and um, and those who have truly been affected um, with with cuts. So um, I respect your 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 comments there, but this is really um, I, I really appreciate Councilmember Basso bringing this forward because I too this has been on my mind and I was prepared to pull the item as well this evening for the same reason. Where thirty thousand dollars is a huge amount, and um, if if that is the amount that we can see, but as we know, the um, with the the COVID impact, if people aren't going to be able to go outside and shop around, it's not at fault because we're not because they can't shop because of the meters. It's because they just can't go outside and be outside to shop freely. So um, I would carry that weight um, for myself or or um, for those reasons you had mentioned. So um, those are just my comments, and I would uh, maintain my second on Councilmember Bosworth's motion. Thank you, Vice Mayor Brooks. Uh, are there any other council comments or questions? I do have a, a couple comments, but I don't want to. Uh, Councilmember Bertrand, go ahead. You're still muted, Councilmember Bertrand. So if this is off the subject, uh, let me know and I'll stop. But the subject was brought up about permits uh, to park in front of the businesses downtown. And I am concerned that um, so many of the people, perhaps, you know, I've heard it mentioned since I've been in Capitola, who work at the restaurants, maybe even the owners of the restaurants, park in front of their places. And to me, I think that's an issue that maybe is being driven by what Dad's talking about. I mean, it's making it a lot worse. So, you know, I, I support supporting the businesses and um, I think the other issue of permits should be addressed later, which I'll bring up maybe at the next meeting. Those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Bertrand. Um, I guess I guess my only comment or concern is that we've had other situations since we've had to to cut back on our budget, where we've had surplus funds and we chose not to put them back towards things like community grants or staff because the question with those funds was always how do we decide and who decides where that money is going to go. And so I guess my only draw back here is if we're saying, well, that's $30,000 of loss to the city, where are we suggesting that that $30,000 would go? Are we suggesting that that $30,000 would go back to community grants? And if that's the case, which grantee would receive it? Are we suggesting that it goes back to staff? And if so, how and to who? And so I, I do have concerns with the idea that, that if we were not to move forward with suspending the parking meter and pay station uh, fees, that somehow we're getting $30,000 back to something, but we're not quite sure what. So that is my concern with this. So I'm, as much as I, um, I'm very much understanding and in agreement with Council Member Bosworth and Vice Mayor Brooks' uh, concerns. I, I'm not prepared to support the motion because I'm not sure where the benefit is um, in, in not doing this. Um, but with that being said, uh, I, I see Council Member Bertrand's hand is still up. Is that for additional comments or is that from the last comment, Council Member? Yes, Bertrand? it is, Mayor. Um, <laughs> comment I wanted to make earlier, then I thought, well, maybe. I don't know. So the idea behind the CARES Act that we've been hearing about is to support uh, small businesses. And economic analysts all the way up to the Fed have realized that with this support at the onset and maybe into the next administration, we don't know, it helps small businesses and it keeps the economy going. You don't want to lose these small businesses because nothing is going to fill the vacuum that fast. And I think that's particularly of concern in Capitola. We, we have a lot of small businesses, and as we know, the Christmas time is one of the times they make up for the lulls caused by our weather and stuff like that. It's not easy to be a small business in Capitola. As we all know, there's been a lot of vacancies over the years, and we, we lament the loss of some of those businesses. So I'm in support of keeping this program going, I understand what Ed is saying and what Yvette is saying in, in support of that, but I think that we have to think in terms of it's a short-term issue here. We want to keep what we have going. 
and it's in recognition of the fact that it's so difficult for our businesses down at the Esplanade to keep going, especially when it's tough. And the COVID has made it even more tough. So, you know, in normal circumstances we do it, but now that we have COVID, I think it's even more tough. So, you know, I'm just not in support of what Ed is bringing forth. I, I understand where, where he's at, and I totally agree. Um, I think we should directly address that with the permit issue, actually, you know, now that it was brought up. Thank you. Those are my comments. Thank you, Councilman Bertrand. Vice Mayor Brooks, and then Councilmember Story after. Yeah, to your point, Mayor Peterson, I was curious about, I, I realize that coming in the next few months, we'll be reviewing our budget and setting some priorities. I was wondering if uh, our city uh, manager could speak to that. Sure, Vice Mayor Brooks. So our, our next scheduled agenda uh, budget review is gonna be coming up in four weeks on December 10th. And at that point, we'll be looking at the first quarter sales tax data as well as our hotel and, and parking meter data. Uh, to date and identifying uh, whether we have budget shortfalls or surpluses and where the council would be looking to allocate them. So we will be having that larger budget conversation coming up in four weeks. Okay, great. Thank you. Council member story. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, one, I, I wanted to uh, respond to Jack, uh, Jacques' concerns, um, you know, about the, uh, the businesses in the village and um, I share that concern. I think all the council members share that concern. Um, you know, however, you know, at this time when the city uh, is has made significant cuts, and the fact, you know, in my view, there's been no um, uh, clarification or assurance that um, cutting the uh, having free parking meters leads to more business or it leads to more retail traffic in the village. Um, we've generally done this just as a matter of seasonal generosity without requiring any kind of proof of its efficacy. Um, and I think that um, Ed has pointed to there's uh, circumstances where maybe it's not being used for the intended purpose. Um, that it's not necessarily generating more retail sales. Um, and, and because if it clearly would, you know, some of this loss would be reflected back in greater sales taxes. Um, but, you know, there's nothing in the record that indicates that that's the case. Um, and I think with that um, and with the significant uh, cuts that we've made, uh, and with the mid-year budget review coming up, um, and, and that's where we will make those decisions about if we have additional money, where, uh, what holes are we going to attempt to refill? Um, but we're not at that point yet. Um, and I think until I were to see some sort of improvements in our budget, um, I would want to, um, I think, support uh, uh, Ed motion um, and not to say that if we come to the mid-year on December 10th and if things look they're moving in a very positive direction maybe we could uh, re-implement um, some of the free parking like a week before the actual Christmas holiday um, because in my view you know we've done this part of just for the you know holiday season um, and, um, and and maybe we would be in a position to do that at that time. Uh, but I think at this time, there's um, all we know is that we have serious budget issues um, and we should, um, I think, use our money um, uh, judiciously. Um, so those are my comments. And you know, at this point, I will support the motion. Thank you, Council Member Story. Um, Councilmember Tron, you have your hand up. Is that for new comments? Yeah, um, in one sense, I agree with Sam. Um, I have not seen a study that shows um, from month to month, year to year, that free parking downtown at the Esplanade has helped our businesses. Um, the only thing I know is that the businesses say that it does. And, um, you know, the streets are crowded and 
you know, at a time when the weather is usually pretty bad, I think that's a good indication that there's probably increased economic activity. So um, he's right. We haven't done a study. We don't know. It's, it's all um, evidence of your eyes that we see a lot of people down there and evidence of what the businesses have told us that this is a great boom to what they consider um, a great business environment. So I, I think there is a benefit. And uh, short of doing a study, you know, we can't really say that there is no benefit at this point. We, do have, we would have to do a study to follow up on that point. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Bertrand. Councilmember Bottorf, I'm, I'm going to come to you next, and then I, I have a question for you on your motion. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Sure. Um, I, I think I just want to address the one concern that you had, because I, I think it, the real crux of what we're talking about now is, if you remember when the city manager came to us and said, members of the city council, we have a serious problem we have to deal with, we immediately cut out all discretionary spending, okay? And when you categorize things, this is absolutely discretionary spending. And the fact that it wasn't cut out, I believe is an oversight. And, and, and to your question, Mayor Peterson, about, you know, when I said that this is gonna cost $30,000, this is $30,000 that we may have had that we don't have. I, I can't tell you that I'm gonna give you this $30,000 to put someplace else. This is money that we're just losing, okay? And, and I don't think we are in any position to say that we, I know that if we give away the free parking, then we definitely will not make that twenty to thirty thousand dollars. So, but I don't think that we have the money yet to say, okay, we can give it to a community grant or something. This is still money that we don't know because, as the city manager alluded to, we have no evidence. We have we have some returns back. Our last reports in August showed us that our TOT was down fifty percent. Our sales tax was down thirty three percent. We have every reason to believe that we are on track to lose the money that the city manager forecasted. So as, as Councilmember Story said, you know, this is the time that you need to strap on your hat and, and, and be ready to, you know, to, to deal with this next year. This is not going to go away anytime soon. So um, I, I just see this as discretionary spending. Uh, and I, I may preclude your question because you asked me a question already and that was what do you see as a good answer? You know, what I thought given this program some thought and we're not here to recreate the, the, the employee parking or the, uh, the Christmas parking program, but I always thought that it would be better to tell the merchants that if somebody came in and bought something in their store, somebody shopped in their store, they could give them a free parking coupon or they could pay reimburse them for their parking and then submit a bill to us for how much they gave away in free parking. And I would feel good knowing that the merchants were re trying to reimburse for the parking and they were offering an incentive to shoppers. That way I would know that it wasn't going to surfers and employees and, and, and anybody else who wasn't down there. If it was truly going to uh, offer something to a merchant, like somebody comes in to Yvonne's and they buy a dress and, and, and they go to the counter and they say, here, Here's a, here's a token for, here's, here's some money for free parking. I think that would be appreciated, but it would also be absolutely, you know, we, we would be able to say this is going to merchants, and I think that's a good way to spread it. But that's a little too hard to implement at this point. Maybe it's something you could think about next year, but, uh, but I definitely think it's a better use of, of our, as Sam said, this was always a just a generosity thing that we, it, 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 we did without anything offered in return. So thank you. And, and, and I, you, you were muted, Councilmember Bottorf. We, we lost the last maybe five words there. Uh, you just, I, I, if you have another question, I'm open to that if you. If you... Yes, I, I do. So I, I completely understand and, and don't disagree with anything that any of, any of the other council members uh, are, are saying here about the concerns with our budget. Um, what I will say is, is, yes, you're right. This is something that, that was done out of generosity in other years. And if there's, while I'm completely understanding the need for us to repair our budget going forward, if there was ever a need for generosity, this is the year for it. However, as you mentioned, I am understanding of the concern. And so I'm wondering if you're willing to accept a friendly amendment to your 
if I understand your motion correctly, it is to, and please, please uh, let me know if this is correct. If I understand correctly, your motion is not to authorize suspending the parking meter and pay station uh, for November 26th through December 25th, correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, so if I understand that correctly, um, what I'm asking for is if you are willing to accept a friendly am amendment to cut it from a full four weeks to two. And that as, and that I could at least give you um, my commitment that as the council's representative to the BIA, that I will ask the BIA members to please speak with their staff and ask that they not utilize the free parking in the village because it is to the benefit of those businesses not to have their employees park there. Now, I can't guarantee they'll do that. I'm not, and they can't guarantee that they that their staffers will do that. But for the sake of, of compromise, I am asking if you'll accept a friendly amendment for it to suspend the holiday parking village, village parking fees for the two weeks prior to Christmas rather than the full four, month, uh, four weeks. And that would give us back about $15,000. Um, you know, Mayor, I, I, I'm, let me tell you what I feel. I, you know, I, when Stan said something about, you know, when the city manager comes back to us on December 10th and if there's some good news there, good news is what I think we need to hear. And, and for us now to say we want to still give something away, I, I mean, I, I guess what I would want to say to you is I appreciate that you are really going to back to the BIA. And I don't want to minimize that. But, but you know, I, I saw some members on this council that were deeply hurt when we took away money from community grants. Mm -hmm. But I do know that unanimously, you all sucked that up. Okay, and, and I, I will never forget that we unanimously did, took a very difficult stance. And, and I, I don't see this one with the BIA as difficult as I do that one, as I do when we took our employees and took money out of their pocket. So I, I, I really don't feel like I'm being consistent by giving money for parking places while our employees some of them don't even have jobs right now. We laid off three people. So I, I, I'm going to reject that from the amendment. Fair enough, Councilmember Bottorf. I appreciate your your um, your your standing on this. Um, in that case, I think that, that for the sake of of a, a, at least saying that I tried, that I will offer a, a substitute motion that we um, that we authorize suspending parking meter and pay station operation for the two weeks prior to Christmas, rather than the full month prior to Christmas. I second. Okay. Let's okay. order now the, the city attorney, for city attorney. Sure. I don't believe the mayor can make the motion. I think it's, I, I can't, the mayor can make a motion. It's, um, Rosenberg says that it's not common, but yes, the mayor can make a motion. I haven't done it all year, Adam. Holding, I held out until my very last full meeting as mayor to do it. I, I think I think Councilman Story is laughing because he finds it highly irregular. Okay, I I, I don't know, but uh, you know what? Uh, I I'm gonna withdraw that uh, that uh, point of order. <laughs> all right. Well, never a dull moment. I'll give us all that. Okay. Um, okay. All right. Uh, is there any, uh, hold on, let me get back so I can see all the participants. Is there any additional questions or comments from, from council? And I see none. So I believe that substitute motion goes first. Is there a second on that motion? I second it. Oh, thank you, okay. Okay, can we have a roll call uh, from the clerk on the substitute motion to suspend parking meter and pay station operation for the two weeks prior to Christmas? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Bertrand. I agree. Councilmember Bottorf. No. Councilmember Story. No. Vice Mayor Brooks. No. Mayor Peterson. Aye. 
Okay. All right, motion does not carry due to uh, lack of majority. All right, can't say I didn't try. We're gonna go back to the original motion then, which is to uh, suspend the part, uh, excuse me, to not suspend parking meter and pay station operation um, for the for the four weeks that we normally do. I do see that council member Story has his hand up though. So before we go to a vote on the original motion, I'm gonna to go to council member Story for comment. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to maybe suggest and uh, before we take uh, a vote on the motion that's on the floor, uh, that uh, maybe we could have an understanding that this matter could be reconsidered at the time of our December 10th uh, mid-year budget review. Is that, an, is that a friendly amendment to council member Vautor's motion? Um, well, the, that we approve it now, but come back to it later. Well, well the won't be there, but I wish you all the best luck. And I think that if Council Member Story wants to pursue that item, I support his endeavor. <laughs> well, I was going to ask the city attorney whether uh, bringing it for reconsideration at a later meeting required a uh, an, an amendment at this time. So you guys are really putting me through my procedural pace <laughs> Um And the answer is no. Uh, a motion for reconsideration must be made in the same meeting in which the item was voted upon and it must be made by um, someone who voted in favor of the item. So a motion for reconsideration would not be an option here. What I might suggest is that if you would like to bring it back at a later date, if you don't, you likely don't need a friendly amendment. You could simply give direction to staff to bring it back at a later date. I, I would propose that um, that after this motion is taken, that we give direction to staff to bring this matter back. Um, now, there is a logistical issue that staff will have to address as to whether. Um, by December 10th, um, you know, the two weeks before Christmas, that starts on December the 12th, um, whether or not there would be sufficient time if we were to decide uh, to suspend parking uh, for that two weeks before Christmas or a week before Christmas for the staff that have the ability to do that. So that's my additional input. Like a response from staff about the timing, or would you rather take this motion up? Are you looking for a response from staff, Councilmember Story? You know, uh, I, 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 if it were in, if staff were saying that uh, that's impossible, there's just no way that can be done. Well, I, I'd like to hear that now. Then we can just uh, put it to rest. But if they don't feel that way, I'm waiting. Uh, I'm willing to wait until we get there. Um, and see if we have consensus to ask staff to get back to us on December the 10th. If we got the direction on December 10th, I, I'm, I'm confident that we could have it up in place and up and running within seven days at the longest, probably less, probably two to three, maybe four days. I don't want to overpromise though without doing more analysis, but you know, we need a little bit of time to set it up. But um, I don't think it, it shouldn't take, it certainly shouldn't take a full week. I think we can get it done in quite a few days less. Thank you, Jane. All right, any other comments from council? Seeing none, can the, uh, can the city clerk uh, repeat back the motion as you understand it? If, if I might, if, excuse me, if I might weigh in for just a second. My understanding of, um, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Councilmember Bottorf, uh, my understanding is that Councilmember Bottorf's motion is to essentially maintain the status quo. And if, 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 if I have that right, the council does not need to take any action. No, if I understand, I guess it depends on what we're considering the status quo, because the status quo for other years was to, um, prevent to, to stop the payment uh, to, to excuse me let me let me go to the, the agenda the status quo for other years was that we would authorize suspending parking meter and pay station operation to allow three hour parking um, to be free and that was the status quo in other years but if you mean allow the status quo to continue as parking 
fees are now, um, then yeah, that's, that's what I understand his motion to be, correct? That's my understanding as well. So okay. if, if the motion is simply to continue with the parking fees as they are now, the council could simply opt to not take action on the item on the agenda. Even though it was pulled from consent and the consent item was to authorize it, we don't need to vote against authorizing it? You could just take no action at all and nothing has changed in the status quo. Okay, I will, uh, I guess I will turn it over to council member Bothorf for, for that decision since you made the motion. Would you like to have a, a formal vote on this or do you want to just stick with no action? Oh, I, I always like to do what's legal and appropriate. I, 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 well, well, I, if I'm following our city attorney's advice, uh, since we've already approved the consent uh, calendar, and uh, if we just go ahead and move on to general government, then we've essentially taken no action. That's right. Would, would, that, uh, would that meet the, the city attorney's guidelines? That's right. It would just, um, it would just maintain the status quo as is. So what the council will be doing is simply not changing the current parking fees. And so if the current parking fees are what you'd like to maintain throughout the holiday season, then you don't need to take any action to not change that. I, I see that if we do not vote to authorize it, then it doesn't happen. And if we just proceed with the on the general government, then no vote was taken. Because we've already voted on one motion and it failed. Is that, is that correct uh, for the attorney? Yes, you voted on the motion to change it from the status quo and that motion failed. So now if you're not interested in changing it from the status quo, you don't need to take any action. That being said, if I have confused things too much, you are welcome to take action to confirm that you're all on the same page. Mayor Peterson, I'll call the question. So you want to vote? Let's do it. Okay. All right. Vice Mayor Brooks has called the question. So can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes. Councilmember Bertrand. Is our is our is Chloe is our city clerk still on the line? You did. I apologize. Here I am. <laughs> Councilmember Bertrand. No. Councilmember Botorf. Aye. Councilmember Story. Aye. Councilmember Brooks. Excuse me, Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. And Mayor Peterson. No. So motion carries uh, three to two. Uh, with that, we are going to move on now uh, to our general government items for the evening. Item 9A, Santa Cruz County presentation of draft action plan addressing homelessness. And I will turn it over to staff. So why don't Hey, uh, camera takes out there. It takes a little moment to pop on. I'm not quite sure why. Uh, I, I'd like to introduce this item. This is going to be presented to us from some different staff in the county. I think I'm going to turn it over to Alyssa Benson, who's a deputy county administrative officer. Alyssa, do you want to jump on? Sure. Hey, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Elisa Benson, and Jamie's actually assistant CAO. No biggie. Um, thank you so much for letting us uh, join you tonight. Um, I'm really, really pleased to be here with my colleagues, Rainy Perez and Randy Morris, who I'll introduce in a moment, and our consultant, Catherine Gale. So tonight we wanted to provide you a fairly high level overview of work that really we started about 18 months ago. And quite frankly, the city was part of our, our effort and our funding for this work. Tonight we're presenting to you our um, final deliverable of this engagement, which is now our Housing for a Healthy Santa Cruz, a three-year strategic framework to address homelessness in Santa Cruz County. And so really this is, you know, started with a, a collaboration across jurisdictional partners, provider partners, um, people experiencing homelessness to really assess how we are, how our system is working and design an action-focused uh, action improvement plan. So I'm here with Randy Murth, our new Human Services Director. And the reason why Randy's here tonight is, quite frankly, on Monday, we will be starting our, um, a new division within Human Services, and Randy, uh, Randy Perez will be part of that division uh, that is 
focusing on on housing on housing for health, and really it's going to be our new um, engine to address homelessness and implement this plan moving forward. So um, Randy's going to share that share the presentation with me tonight, and I am going to share my screen. We have a pretty short PowerPoint, um, and we're happy to answer as many questions as you guys may have. So let me do that. Can you guys see that okay? Wait, no, now you can't. Can you see that okay? Okay, Randy's saying yes. Great. So uh, that is, of course, our little cover slide, and I'm going to just very quickly, what we're going to go through at a pretty high clip is kind of the context, how we got here. Um, a summary of the framework, some quick uh, next steps for community input to finalize the framework, and really, most importantly, help us craft our first six-month work plan. And then we'll have time for questions and answers. So I think it's always important to start with the data. Um, I think everyone's painfully aware that homelessness is a critical issue, not just locally, but at a national level, a state level, and, and here in our community. Uh, pretty much you can visit nearly any West Coast community and the impact of sort of unaffordable housing, poverty, addiction, mental health challenges, loss of, of, health, loss of housing or, or health care crises as a, are some of, the, some of the root causes for um, homelessness in our community. But what we find here in Santa Cruz County, and this is this chart, um, around the number of persons experiencing homelessness per 10,000. In Santa Cruz County, the orange bar, we're, we're nearly double the state average with about 80 people per 10,000 residents um, that are experiencing homelessness. We're the highest. There are other counties that are higher than us, and we're clearly not the lowest, but it's really remarkably disproportional to, um, to our population. And one of the impacts for, for us with that is when you see state dollars flowing and we see the top 13 cities in the state getting special earmarks, we're not in there. And some, several times they had actually lower concentrations of homelessness per thousand than we are. So we do have, while it's a prevalent problem, we do have our, there is a unique characteristic to it here in our community. Again, going with the data, I want to just make sure everyone's up to date with the last uh, point in time count from January 2019. Uh, our number, we were, we were starting to sort of trend down a little bit with about 2,200, 20, I'm sorry, 2,167 counted that, that evening in January. But it's really important here to, to look at the breakdown in terms of, of the populations within our homeless community. We have a, a large number, 403 of that, that were identified as chronically homeless. Um, 151 were veterans. About 419 were, fam were members of families. That's 122 households, um, and that's including children. We had 51 unaccompanied children. And probably the one that catches people's eye quite dramatically is nearly a quarter of our homeless were transition age youth. So this is 18 to 25. Some of you may be familiar with what we do, and Rainey was part of this. Um, we, have some, we were one of the first communities in the country to get a, a special grant called the Youth Homelessness Demonstration Project. And, and we, are, we are starting to get those programs off the ground and really trying to make a difference. The other two important statistics I just want to start with as we talk about this tonight is 78% of these folks are unsheltered. So that is something where other communities have, have a much stronger sheltering program than we do. This is something that's, that is um, not, a, not one of our metrics that we're proud of. The other really important metric, and we will come back to this when we talk about one of the strategies, is in this report, 40% of the folks uh, counted that night identified this was their first time being homeless, 40%. So we have a large number of people who are becoming homeless regularly. Our flow is high. So that's kind of that data background. With that, I'm going to jump right into, so what did we do? Um, really quickly, um, Carlos Palacios, my boss, uh, asked me when I started here with the county in 2018, 
along with Rainey, to look into sort of how are county departments trying to implement the 2015 all-in plan and, and, and what could we do? And, and we recognize that aside from having a great plan, people just did not have an operational framework for really focusing and prioritizing. And with that, that sort of led to this broader recommendation to ask for some outside technical assistance. And so our board approved in February of 2018, I'm sorry, 2019, an engagement with Focus Strategies, the consulting firm that we hired that is a nationally recognized firm that works solely with, on the issue of homelessness with communities across the country. And, and the charge for that work was an inclusive and collaborative process to assess our current performance and then really develop a recommendation on uh, system level performance measures, targets, governance and decision making and a detailed action plan to get there. So that's what we're gonna bring, with, bring to you tonight. Um, I will, so you look through this phasing, you know, we, we, were, we were at a good clip. We were working hard in phase one and phase two and, and in phase two that March, many of you may have actually gotten invitations last March to a community convening where we're gonna share data and do the planning. Lo and behold, we were all in a global pandemic. Now, so we also then came together as a larger community for a very um, extensive response to COVID and how to address it within our com uh, homeless community. And I will say um, that's been ongoing. It's really taken a lot of our attention, but it also has provided us some amazing opportunities for learning. Um, rapid coordinated decision-making to implement some things, the importance of low barrier shelter, and really an expanded and redesigned approach to outreach around COVID and public health. And that has influenced where we've gone in this plan. So here we are today. We got a little bit uh, off track again because of a massive wildfire, as you all know. Um, but we are here, here today with our proposed framework and we took it to the board on Tuesday and a number of other cities and, and we're really pleased to bring, bring it to you tonight. First half was assessment. Uh, what did we find? Um, the, the, the finding of focus and, and, and really all of us recognized it as we started, started down this path was we had a lot of the pieces. The, the strength of our system was we had the components but the issue was it wasn't really to scale and wasn't integrated um, the way you need it to be uh, really effective to help all people who are experiencing homelessness. Our gaps were we needed more diversion, those questions, those engagements with, per with every person around a pathway back to housing, that our shelter was really just focused on basic needs and not that pathway. Uh, we have low success rates in terms of actual successfully getting people to permanent housing and our governance and, de and decision-making was not transparent or results-focused. Um, staffing capacity, not adequate. That's why we're starting this new division. Uh, and we really did not have a mature uh, use of data to drive decision-making or improvements. So this is a really honest assessment, a hard look in the mirror. And I wanna say that while this started as county work, everyone, providers, cities, um, stakeholders in the community have all sort of the, the focus strategies work as we've called it became everyone's work. It's really been a, vi a village and we have said, we know we have to do better. You look around, we're, we're, not, we're not doing um, our community justice around this issue and people are ready to do that. Um, so the goal is to move from this loosely coordinated system of programs and activities that addresses some homelessness to really a strongly coordinated system that addresses all homelessness. So with that, I'm gonna pass it to Randy. And Randy, please introduce yourself. I'm not sure folks know you. Yeah, um, so Mayor Peterson and Vice Mayor Brooks and the council members and staff, Jamie, I've had the pleasure of meeting in a few meetings, but I, um, Randy Morris, the County Human Services Director, and I started in February, um, and about three weeks later, COVID hit. So my journey here has been one uh, in crisis. If you don't know county government very well and what human services offices do, you might know some of the programs that we run throughout California. Um, three big operations, which is you know foster care, um, welfare and employment programs like CalFresh and Medi-Cal and CalWORKs, and then aging and disability programs like in-home supportive services and adult protective services. 
And the transition that Elisa just mentioned of uh, the CAO's office being the administrative hub of the homeless service program being transitioned to human services is um, somewhat consistent with the conversation that's happening throughout all of California, which is what is the role of county government versus city government? And then if county government is going to take a leadership role as Carlos Palacios took, our CAO, um, because before him I understand the county did not take as active a role, where's the administrative hub? And more and more uh, counties are putting it in the direct service programs like Health and Human Services because it aligns with our mission and it lines up with a lot of programs we provide and a lot of the um, people that we serve are experiencing homelessness. So I am very mindful it is 8, 10 at night, <laughs> and I just uh, watched Democracy in Action, and I just want to recognize the respect I observed you guys walk through in a um, difficult issue in COVID with the recession and the challenges we all face, and I just wanted to take a minute to recognize I really um, appreciated watching the respect you guys shared with each other and took a vote. and. Mindful it's happening in D.C. It's nice to be part of a democracy that seems to be functioning. Or you guys fake it very well. It looked very real. <laughs> um, but anyhow, this is, uh, you know, from parking meters and businesses to um, the thousands of people who are homeless. Um, these are all challenging issues we're facing in our, in our um, work that we do. Um, so this three-year plan, um, just going to briefly talk about the framework and where this all leads to, just if you're kind of wrapping your head around why we're giving you this presentation is um, this is the unveiling of this plan that's the byproduct of 18 months of work. And then in early 2021, we're gonna be coming back to the board and all four um, cities, if you will welcome us back, to ask for your um, adoption of this plan. We're gonna sort of pretty it up, get um, some feedback from people, get some nice graphics in the plan, and then really mindful of the uh, recession that you're all struggling with, we're all struggling with, ask for um, participation in the plan. Because as Elisa said, we're not going to be able to solve this issue unless we can get engagement in whatever capacity you might have, even if that's participating committees and helping be thought partners along the way. So that's where this is going. Um, vision and guiding principles, um, Elisa mentioned a number of them. Um, this uh, is really going to be built on some data. We're really asking for countywide cross-sector involvement. We really built in a number of actionable items. It's not just a visionary document. It actually has real action steps in here. And we're really trying to keep an eye on equity. Um, there's a lot of north-south um, dynamics in this community, and we want to keep an eye on what equity issues play out with those experiencing homelessness. Um, it is very specific in the goals that we're looking for with very specific targets that we're going to be able to measure. Um, it breaks down into some strategies and objectives, and we're going to walk through a little bit of them. And then, as I mentioned, throughout this three years, given the environment's very fluid, um, every six months we're going to re-upping a work plan. And this, too, is something we'd like to do in partnership with the four cities in this community. Um, and then finally, I can't speak to how you all feel or what your thoughts are as uh, policymakers about the issue of homelessness in Santa Cruz County and in your city. But it is very, very complicated to determine what the role of city versus county versus state versus federal government is. So this framework also outlines what resources we need, what assumptions we have, and who we think needs to do what. And we hope to work on that with you so that we don't assume what you think your role is and you assume what our role is, but we work together on that. So that's the basic frame. Elisa as the one clicking the buttons, if you can go to the next one. <clears throat> Um, so this, if you take away anything, this is the um, ambitious, but if all things work, we think actionable and achievable goal, which is by the end of this plan in 2024, we'll hit two targets um, and have to give you a little bit of semantic check about what these words mean, unsheltered versus overall. So unsheltered homelessness is basically all people who do not have a home um, and they're not living in a shelter because there's a real distinct difference between people who have a shelter to stay, but it's not their home. So unsheltered are people in encampments and vehicles and other places that aren't their home. And we would like to reduce that number by 50% using this point in time count that is done um, every two years and we might increase that. Um, but when you include those who are actually living in shelters, hopefully temporarily, but way too often they're there longer than temporarily, um, we'd like to reduce the overall number by 30%. So that's the big, big targets that we're looking for with lots of details underneath it. So Lisa, if you can move to the next one. Um, this breaks it down a little bit further. 
Um, we want to make sure that all the different programs we run are more effective and the bullet points sort of break down what that looks like in action with some measurable um, goals, which I'll, I'll get through in a minute. And then we also have to increase our capacity. We have to have more shelters and we have to have more housing slots. And uh, we can't just be serving people who are homeless in shelters if we don't have a place to put them. So next one, Elisa. <clears throat> So this is how we break it down into sort of four legs of a chair and all of these need to function well to um, be successful. So the upper left box is uh, that we want to better connect and serve. So that means we wanna reach those who are experiencing homelessness, even if they're in our shelter systems or if they're unsheltered um, for the, through a host of measures. We wanna figure out better ways to connect to those people who are um, experiencing homelessness. The upper right box is we need to have a pathway to go somewhere. Um, this community, like many high cost coastal communities, does not have a lot of affordable housing. So we have some um, very concrete efforts we're gonna try to increase our capacity to have more housing slots. Uh, the lower left is we can't just focus on those who are homeless now and try to get them into housing if we keep having people falling into homelessness. And I think this recession and the fires in Santa Cruz County is gonna make this issue worse. So we have the whole host of prevention strategies. Um, and then the last one, and this is where um, Jamie has some experience in connecting with us as your city manager, but we need to have administrative functions to make decisions as city and county together and within county together with our electeds and with our um, staff colleagues. So those are the sort of four um, pillars of, of the uh, plan. And at least for the next one. So this is where I mentioned um, assumptions. Um, we are being very honest and transparent with the community, what it is we are assuming along the way because these variables are not all in our control. Um, the housing market is very fickle and we don't know what the pandemic and the recession, the fires and the uh, federal elections will do in terms of impacting uh, our housing. Uh, if you don't know county government very well, we are heavily dependent on st state and federal resources. My department, for example, 90% of the funds in my $150 million budget are state and federal. Um, very similar in housing and homeless services. So we don't know what's gonna happen with the state budget or what's gonna happen with the federal um, landscape. Um, Elisa mentioned uh, her and some of you know Rainy very well and you might know Tatiana who's the other person who's worked with Elisa. That's a mighty team of three. Um, they're trans uh, Tatiana and Rainy are uh, transferring to my department next week where we're standing up a new office where it's gonna be a little bit larger but we don't know how many staffing resources we need to manage this plan. We think we're staffed well but we're gonna have to track that. Um, prioritizing available funding. Um, city planning departments and county planning departments sometimes receive money and they have discretion where to purpose that money. And sometimes for reasons that make sense within that jurisdiction, they're not purposed towards um, making low income or very low income housing slots available. So we don't have control over that. That's something we have to track. Um, capacity amongst developers and service providers to you, our elected officials, um, both at the county level and at the city level, there's gonna be choices you have to make during this three year when moments are presented to you about issues like siting when uh, uh, housing developers are here that are gonna be complicated for everyone to work through and we don't have control over that, but we're gonna hopefully be honest and share what we think would be needed to help move the needle. Um, and then working together effectively. Um, there's tensions between cities and counties throughout all of California because there's not clear guidance from the state or the federal government of actually whose role is what, and there's a lot of finger pointing going on. So we hope to maximize collaboration and minimize the, the um, finger pointing that just happens with uh, this vexing public policy issue. So next, uh, Lisa, and we're almost done for those of you hanging in there. <laughs> so um, here's a fun little picture. I'm gonna call it a rowboat. We wanna have our oars moving in the right direction. And on the left, it talks about, these are sort of a summary of what we just walked through. And on the right, we just need the partnership. And um, I think this is just gonna segue to what that would that look like? What was the takeaway? What's the actionable item we're asking of you? Uh, you go to the next one, Elisa. Um, so here's where we are. As Elisa mentioned, we presented to the board, Elisa and I on uh, Tuesday morning. I made it to the Sentinel um, the next morning. Uh, we're now in our tour of the cities. Uh, thank you for hosting us. 
And then what's going to happen is in the months of uh, November and December, probably around mid-December, we're going to be having an online uh, survey. We're going to share that with your city office. And if you can um, encourage people to respond, it'll be a survey monkey asking people to take a look at this, uh, share your thoughts. We want the end product to be something that represents uh, what those who are interested in this topic have to share. We are going to be doing some in-person social distance uh, survey of people with lived experience throughout the county. And then there's a few uh, meetings that um, Elisa mentioned our uh, consultants focused strategies are coordinating with some of our stakeholders that are pre-existing. And then we would like to come back to the board and all four city councils in January. And we would like to have you all officially adopt this as a framework. I think that's going to be the easier ask. The plan is going to be very, um, I think, easy to uh, get behind. But also the first six-month work plan, and that's where we have some asks of you to consider. Um, over the next few months, we'd like to be able to see that we have participation, even if it's just thought partner participation on committees to uh, be a participant in some of the work we want to do during the first six months. And we'll detail that between now and January when we come back. And I think if that close it out for any questions that you might have for us. And thank you again for uh, hosting us, especially this late hour after that parking discussion. <laughs> thank you both so much. Really appreciate that presentation. I will bring it to council for questions at this time. And we will start with council member Bertrand and then we'll go to council member story. Um, thank you very much for the presentation, uh, Randy. Um, uh, nice meeting everyone that's going to be working with you. Um, so in terms of the goals, uh, I think 50-30, just to remind you, how were those set? What was the, what are the metrics? I mean, I suppose it's based on funding and the success of the uh, programs that you have now in terms of track record. Uh, can you just sort of give me an idea how you got to that? Sure, and we have, um, as I mentioned, we have Catherine Dale, who's one of our principal consultants on this. One of the pieces of this work was, quite frankly, some predictive modeling. In that second bucket of um, that second bucket of work, when we did our quantitative analysis, this was taking all our data out of our HMIS system. This is our homeless management information system, and looking on how uh, different various interventions length of stay, exit rates um, were working. And looking at the, what the different types of housing stock we have, our shelter beds, how they were working. And so we built a baseline model. And then and we talked about, we worked with focus strategies to think incrementally over the three year period, if certain kinds of our interventions were improved, what could we expect? So we did this sort of working our way through setting stretch targets. They, this, this is all in the 20 page plan, but where we could understand if we could meet those metrics operationally, if we could add the kinds of capacity that we articulated in the highlights, we would be able to, to hit those targets at the end. So it was really based on how our system was functioning today in, in a very, um, specific way, and then if we were able to improve in very specific ways, what that would look like at the end of three years. So that's how we did it. Um, it was not sort of just pulling something, it would be nice to cut our shelter down to 50. It was, okay, if we can add 160 beds of this type, and we can add case management and housing navigation that improves the throughput of how long people are in shelter, what will that do? That's how we got to these, um, these goals. And then there's a bunch of, as I mentioned, specific operational metrics we'll be working on um, to get us there. Thank you very much. Um, that's the answer I'd like, you know, because of my background, that makes a lot of sense to me. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Bertrand. We'll go to Councilmember Story. Yeah, thank you, Mayor, um, and thank you, Randy uh, and Lisa, for bringing us this presentation. Uh, we look forward to hearing more about it and uh, hopefully having it before us in January 21 for adoption. Um, you know, there's, there's so many questions that can be asked about trying to uh, solve or reduce the issue of homelessness in San Francisco County um, and throughout our society, but I, I guess a couple I want to um, 
maybe focus on um, is under your second strategy, it, it was to increase the housing stock. Um, and I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about, uh, if you know, well, how are you going to approach that? Um, and whether you're going to rely on the private market, market to uh, provide affordable housing or are there some um, uh, public um, initiatives uh, that may help um, facilitate uh, and develop uh, increased housing stock. And also on the third strategy concerning prevention, and, and I was, I wanted to ask whether what we're seeing with the, um, you know, the collapse of the economy, uh, people losing their jobs, um, and the, and the uh, ev um, eviction moratorium fairly soon here, uh, and maybe already starting uh, to um, um, be uh, eliminated, whether you're anticipating uh, an uptick uh, in people losing their housing uh, through eviction and whether there's an immediate plan to help um, uh, those folks. Um, so those are my two questions for now. Thank you. I'm, I'm trying to think, Randy, do you want me to take a stab and then you want to add or? Sure, why don't you do uh, the really simple one of housing stock and then I'll take the simple one of prevention. So sure. I think we could take advantage of Catherine too, who does this nationally. Um, so. Absolutely. So in terms of our specific plan, um, we well, we think we have stretch goals. We think they're attainable goals. And what we talk about in terms of housing exits and housing stock is a focus first and foremost on an increase of units of permanent supportive housing. So that specialty niche housing for some of our most vulnerable folks um, that you, you don't, you can't really rely on the market to develop those. Those are things that are heavily subsidized and financed from a public sector standpoint, though you might be working very actively with a affordable housing developer to do that. And, and that goal of 100 uh, additional uh, of spots is, is, a, is a sizable one, but when we think it's attainable based on work or projects in the pipeline, both um, in, in a, a number, well, in particularly in the city of Santa Cruz, but also work that, that we are doing as a county um, in the unincorporated areas. So that particular piece of the housing puzzle is something we think is very important for the population we have here. The other piece that's articulated is a significant increase in our rapid rehousing, um, uh, these are rental assistance programs. So a very particular type of intervention. Uh, you know, it's not new stock, but it's, it's new resources to get people on a supported path to housing. And the increase there is, a, is 350 slots over the three year period. We did not set an actual target around um, I would say, you know, extremely low income affordable housing. That is something that is, I would, something that could be in this, in this document if, if we get there. And I want us to, I hope everyone will take this. It, it does need to be a living, breathing document. And as we move forward, that would be something we would want to talk about as a region. It's how do we actually look at, there's a significant gap with them, which I'm sure you all are well aware of in terms of of just just both the um, the backlog, you know, our missed opportunity for that that type of uh, of housing that's affordable for folks that are 30 percent or less than um, average medium income. Um, there's a significant significant backlog that we haven't met, and then as we look at population, it continues to grow. But we're really focused on PSH and rapid, rent, rapid rehousing programs as sort of our key interventions for right now. Okay, thank you for taking the tough one. <laughs> um, uh, prevention is differently tough. Uh, thank you for the question and you are clearly and absolutely right that we're bracing ourselves for it possibly getting worse as a national issue and a California issue. Um, I wanna answer that in two ways. One is how important it is for us to continue to lobby for state and federal waivers and opportunities. And just as one small example, you may or may not have heard of this thing called whole person care. It was actually California lobbied very hard and applied for a waiver of federal Medicaid money. 
to have you know Medicaid money to be used to help people who are on Medi-Cal have some role in helping people with their housing. You know, that's a very creative example to help keep people housed who are on low income public programs. But it took a lot of lobbying and act of the fed, federal government, and state government, and then local governments can um, implement them, and that's actually a waiver. So there's going to have to be continued creativity. Um, and then there are a lot of good programs that we run in Health and Human Services that do help people um, prevent them from dropping into homelessness, and we just have to figure out ways to resource um, them and expand them so that we stop the flow. So. If you look, have a chance to look at the plan, you'll see some details about what that looks like, but it is something we're tracking closely and very anxious about um, because the recession is so serious. I would add one other thing to that, which is um, one of the things the county has done with our CARES Act dollars is um, a, a number of um, rental assistance programs that's not around homelessness, but about folks who are housed, but you know are not able to, um, because of the economic impact of COVID, pay their pay their bills. And so we're trying to do that. I know other jurisdictions are doing that as well. Um, of course, the challenge is much of that money you're supposed to spend by the end of December, so it's a little bit of a challenge. But that's something else we're going to all have to be looking at: is what kind of prevention rental assistance programs can we continue to to offer and, and hopefully expand. Thank you for the, those answers. Appreciate it. All right. I see a couple more hands up. I think I can't. Was it Ed? Were you next? Councilmember Botworth? I believe so. You're still muted. There you uh, go. Go ahead, go ahead and let uh, Vice Mayor Brooks go. All right. Vice Mayor Brooks, you're up. Thank you, Councilmember Botworth. Um, hopefully, this is just real quick. What um, was the the plan modeled after was it did you use another city you might have said this already but i was just curious where this came from i would what do i want to say well actually that's probably a good catherine question what it was modeled after is really best practice as focus shared with us around a systems approach um and you know looking at the different kinds of interventions it Focus has brought this framework, this let's look at how things are working in your community. And like I said, we were fortunate enough to have the, many of the pieces just not quite harnessed and honed and integrated. I mean, we weren't missing something big. It was just like, let's look at what you have, how they're actually functioning and what you can do better. Um, so it's, it's we've, We've been working at this a long time, but we have not been able to do it sort of with the fidelity and um, the linkage of systems of care, not to sound too jargony, but like just whether it's behavioral health, physical health, Randy's programs and human services. You know, we were looking at it in sort of like a shelter system. Now that has to exist within a whole bunch of other services. And I think one of the incredible moments we're at right now between our boss and our board saying, we need to step into this void and help provide more guidance and, and a backbone of, of administration to support the region stepping in and stepping up, but also bringing more of our, I want to do leveraging our, our health and human service resources that serve these same people from a different perspective and integrating it with that question of how do we get you to housing? Thank you, Lisa. I guess I was just being a little bit more specific if there was something that we could look to to see how this plan has been implemented in other cities, if this, was, if this idea was borrowed or um, as we move forward. I think, I think Randy's right. We should ask Catherine, the one who's worked in a lot of other cities, about, um, about what, what she would say about what, what, we are, what we're copying and what we think we're so unique. Thanks, Elisa. Hi, everyone. I'm Catherine Gale. I'm Principal Associate with Focus Strategies. Uh, we're a, a West Coast-based but nationally operating firm focused on helping local communities use their own data and their own experience to uh, create uh, programs and plans to address homelessness. 
particularly coming from a data-driven perspective. So I think if I'm understanding Vice Mayor Brooks' question, the plan is not cookie cutter. So I, I, we don't come in and say, look, we'll just take your data and fill it in and here's your pre-written plan. Um, part of the reason this engagement has been now nearly 18 months, some of that was COVID, it would have been a little bit shorter otherwise, was that we took the time to do a baseline assessment of what was going on here to work with the folks at the county and the cities. I met with um, some of the folks in Capitola back in, I'm going to say maybe April of 2019. Um, along with other stakeholders, we did, as Elisa described, this base year calculation, which is what are you getting now? So what are you buying, essentially, as a community? What are you investing and what are you getting from that? So we get all the data from all the providers about what their programs are and how much they cost. And we get all the data from the uh, information system about what kind of outcomes. And then we come back and say, based on your situation and based on what we know about best practices, we think you can get further with what you have. And we also think that you need to add more capacity to get to the goal. So to, to Elisa's point, the modeling starts from what's actually happening in the community and what the resources are, and then it takes scenarios and says, if you wanted to end it, what would it take? And that might be beyond your grasp. If you just keep doing what you're doing, where will you get? And the modeling tends to show that it will actually continue to go up if you don't do something different. And then what's a, what's a reasonable uh, approach that you can take over the time frame that you're interested in? Within that, it's informed by what we know about best practices. So some of what was in the slides that showed that you can address, you can have very good individual programs and address some homelessness. But if you don't have a strategy and a system that works together, it's really hard to actually turn the curve and bring a needle down. And so when we look at other places in the country that either we've worked with or other folks have worked with, this set of strategies of sort of uh, having your emergency system be, be focused on getting people into housing looking at your outcomes and your, uh, pro uh, your rates of progress and holding yourself accountable for that. Um, investing in the kinds of housing that Elisa talked about and to the prevention point, making sure that you're not using your homeless system to temporarily shelter or house people who actually don't need that. So one of the things our analysis found was that there were actually people going into shelter who had had a place to stay the night before. But if they had had appropriate prevention services, they wouldn't have needed to take that shelter bed and that bed could have been made available then to someone else who could use it. So we take all that and then, so is the plan like based on somebody else's? We looked at some other ones around the, the state that have come out recently and we're modeling some things like our idea that uh, Randy talked about to have it be more graphically pleasing on certain things we've seen. But I would say this is very much a plan that was created in Santa Cruz informed by your local data and what we know nationally. I hope that answers your question. Great, thank you. I see uh, Council Member Botworth has had his hand up. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I first of all want to thank you all for your presentation. And uh, the first thing I noticed is a tremendous amount of enthusiasm and confidence that you're portraying. And, and I think that's what's necessary here. We, we all know, and you know this more than I do, that this has been tried many times to be resolved, and it's going to take a great effort. I think my disclosure that I want to make to you now is, is that uh, I'm going to be turned out in this position, and there'll be a new space in this box when you come back next time. And uh, I just want you to know that as I'm leaving, I, I appreciate this effort you're all making. I know this council is going to work hard with you to do whatever it takes. To, uh, to play our part in, in, in trying to find a solution. And I just want to wish you the best of luck in everything you're doing and keep up that level of enthusiasm that I saw tonight. And I appreciate all your efforts. Thank you. Thank you. And Councilor Robert Rich Khan. Yeah. Um, it's sort of a general question, but I often wonder about the people who are giving the services and will be participating in the various programs, the level of involvement they have with the people on the streets and the people who need help 
to the extent that they know their names and they know their individual stories. And it's not just, you know, come in for an appointment, they get a program plan and then they're sent out the door. Um, how much emphasis is there, emphasis is there um, on actually knowing the individual people to the extent that they're well aware of their situations? I'm trying to, Randy, you, where are you? So <laughs> I, I, wanted, I would say two things. Um, one of the, well, if, we, if you just go to the plan and you look at the values, um, it is about being person-centered. It is about understanding someone's individual story. And I think what's really important is us understanding um, the, the experience of homelessness in South County is different than the experience of homelessness in North County. And there's a whole lot of people who are not street homeless. They're, they are working very, very hard to be invisible. And how do we do a better job making the right point of contact with those folks and trying to figure out how can we, whether it's through the homeless system or these other systems of support, help them get what they need. Um, so I would first say with the value, but there's another piece that I think is really important and this is actually in the, um, that fourth bucket that, that Randy talked about around improved administration. And there are, I think if I remember it correctly, so we have four sub-strategies in that area and I think there are 17 objectives across those four sub-strategies. And one of those sub-strategies is authentically engaging people with lived experience of homelessness in, as, as that voice of our client, of what's working, what's not. So not just in terms of that that one-for-one -one service relationship, but we need to know, you know, we're looking at this one as housed people more often than not. Not, not really understanding the experience directly, how do we bring that voice into design, into evaluation? Um, and that is one of the things, it's hard to do. It's very hard to do. And Randy has a lot of experience in other human services area with the difficulty of bringing that, that consumer perspective in. But I think that's a piece I would also highlight to, um, to honor what you're talking about. That these are people. We try not to use the word the homeless. This is, these are people who are homeless. Um, so I guess that would just be my response to your, your question, council member. Can I add something quickly, Lisa? Sure. I, I also just wanna add, and I really appreciate the question that um, I, I spoke a lot about the work that we do being data driven, but it's actually information driven and that information isn't always numbers and it involves people with lived experience. And as part of this process, twice in the engagement, we did a number of focus groups around the county. Um, I went to the Salvation Army both in Santa Cruz and in Watsonville. I went to a program, a family program in Watsonville. I met with folks at uh, one of the rotating shelters and we asked people what was most important to them. And I think the plan really reflects that in a number of ways. I mean, the thing of course most people say is they need a place to live. Many people would like a job. Um, a, a lot of folks want um, some kind of human connection. Um, and um, one of the things that they said was it was really important to have a consistent person that they could connect with and that that was very variable across the county so that there are some programs and places where people really feel like I've got this great advocate, they work with me and that's what I need and other places that people said I can't get that and that is really reflected in actually some of the stuff that's both in the plan and I think is part of the immediate work plan right now to try and make that available to more people because it, it absolutely came from the mouths of people who were experiencing homelessness, that that was the thing that they needed, so. Well, I, I couldn't agree with more, uh, obviously. I mean, they, they have to have that connection and that will keep them in the program, that will keep you coming back, that will keep you connecting with them so you can follow and all sorts of good benefits. So you have to have those connections and um, I'm only familiar with big programs in San Francisco, a lot of friends that work in this area. And one friend of mine who's been involved for many years, when he died, there was about 300 people, all homeless by and large, that came to his uh, wake. And that was someone who truly had a connection and he did a lot of good. I wish there was more of them. Thank you. 
All right, thank you so much, Councilmember Bertrand, for your comments. Thank you all for your presentation. Really appreciate you being here tonight at almost nine o'clock this evening to share this important information with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. All right. We are going to move on now to item 9B and receive an update on the city's pandemic response. And I will turn it over to staff. Well, Madam Mayor, my battery, sorry to interrupt. My battery's just about to die. So if I leave the meeting, that's the reason why. Okay, thank you for letting us know. I'm gonna kind of pull up presentation here. That didn't go as planned. My apologies. Try again. Okay. So we haven't put one of these items on an agenda, uh, on a general government agenda for discussion in a while, and we thought it was probably a good opportunity for us to do that again um, for a number of reasons. Number one is, is obviously in the media, and as Mayor Peterson, I believe, announced at the beginning of the meeting, we've had a national rise in the coronavirus cases here this fall. Uh, really since beginning of October, we've seen pretty steady and increasing uh, caseloads uh, throughout the country, particularly in the Midwest. However, um, in the last half of the month, last week or so of October and now into November, we've started to see those increases spill out into California as well. And further, over the last week or so, we've started to see, maybe two weeks, we've started to see increasing cases here in Santa Cruz County. So this is showing our, our, our case loads for Santa Cruz County. You'll see relatively small numbers through March, April, May. We saw the summer spike in cases, case loads dropped off. We saw things pick up again. I believe it was after Labor Day. Case numbers came back down, and now we're starting to see in this beginning of November a rise um, coming as well. We've had 80 cases in the city of Capitola. Uh, I asked our clerk who was pulling this information together how that compared to the increases we've seen county wide. And what we realized was that about a week ago when we were preparing the agenda report, the countywide number was about 10% lower. It was about 3,000 and today it's 3,300. And the Capitola number was about 73. So it increased at about 10% as well. So Right now, at least, the change over the last week, countywide and in the city of Capitola, seem to be pretty close to mirror, mirroring each other, which is, which is interesting, because during the summer peak, Capitola definitely experienced fewer cases per capita than other portions of the county, including the South County. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about the blueprint for safer economy. We've been operating under this new system for the state of California since the end of August. It's a four-tiered system. You often hear people talk about the colors, the different colors that correspond with the different tiers. Each one of those different tiers has explicit guidance in terms of both the number of the, the triggers to move between the different tiers, uh, which are the average number of cases uh, over the last week, and in addition, the positivity rate of the tests that you do. And then within the tiers, there's explicit guidance for how much uh, activity, business activity, and commercial activity is allowed when you're in one of those different tiers. And then every Tuesday, council members have probably gotten used to this. Frequently, I'm sending out emails to council on Tuesday announcing the changes in the tiers, because that's when the state of California announces the changes. Um, there are four tiers. Uh, purple is the worst, widespread, which is where we started when the system rolled out in August. Substantial red is the second tier, and then orange and then yellow. Uh, the, the, the metrics, as you can see here, are if you have more than seven cases, daily new cases per 100,000, uh, that's the trigger to move into the purple tier. But between four and six, that's the red tier. And one to four is the moderate tier. And then less than one is the minimal tier. Um, we, as a county, started out in the purple tier, as I mentioned. We spent two weeks there at the end of August. Uh, early September, moved into the red tier 
We were there for seven weeks, moved into the orange tier. We were there for only two weeks, and just this week we moved back into the red tier. So unfortunately, we had a good run of it, and it's looking like, at least based on the numbers, that we've moved into a worse direction. Fingers crossed it doesn't get worse next Tuesday or the following week. This shows the state of California, the map of all the counties around the, the state. Uh, you can see we are in that, uh, sorry, the red tier. <laughs> the colors kind of blur together at this, at this hour sometimes. Monterey County to our south has remained in purple. They've had a difficult time getting their case numbers down. Large portions of Southern California are in purple. Um, the trend around the state this week was for counties to be moving backwards rather than forwards, unfortunately. I think I mentioned previously, and most people are familiar that under the red tier, there's explicit guidance about what can, can and can't happen. I think the most important changes that we all notice are the retail is supposed to operate at 50% of their typical capacity. Uh, the restaurants, only 25% of their seating capacity indoors, they can still seat outdoors. Gyms at 10% and bars that don't serve food are closed. Um, I'm going to be reiterating again the message the mayor related at the beginning about that many of the outbreaks have been tra traced back to uh, family gatherings, gatherings of individuals. Um, at this point, the best guidance for the holidays and the winter break is to stay home and stay with your family. If you do do a gathering, uh, the public health guidance is to do your best to do it outdoors, keep it to no more than three separate households, keep it shorter in time, and try to minimize your interactions with different households, try to stay within your bubble if you can. So with that, that's really all I had. If there's any explicit questions about this update, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Are there any council members that have questions on this item? Council member Story. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, Jamie, just um, I noticed in the staff report, it says that uh, the museum director was considering developing a plan to reopen. Um, but since we're back in the red tier, is that still um, uh, the plan? You know, my assumption is that in the red tier, we probably can't reopen. Uh, I will defer to our moderator, actually, at this point, who supervises the museum. And Larry, have you talked to Frank about the tier change and what the implications are for the museum? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Council Member Story. Um, I actually spoke with the uh, museum curator, Frank Perry, this morning, and he is getting everything ready, but they're not, now that we're back in the red, they are not going to reopen. He's still working on the, the plans that he was working on if we get back to, when, when we get back to the orange, but at this point in the red tier, there there are no plans to open during this, at this time. Okay. Thank you. That, that makes, uh, that sounds pretty good. Appreciate it. All right, any other questions from council members? Seeing none, we will go to the public. Is there any public comment? Oh, uh, council member, uh, Vice Mayor Brooks, do you have a question or a comment? I had a co uh, question, I'm so sorry. The, my button wasn't working. Um, has the change in peers affected our out of school program at all um, or will it? That is a good question. Um, the biggest change, my understanding is we set this thing up when the schools were closed and we were in purple is my understanding. So this was designed to operate within the public health, public health director's guidance um, for, for the, the limited interactions between students, keeping them stable groups of 12. So my understanding is, is that the way we have it set up, it can operate in any of the tiers unless we revert back to a shelter in place order where people aren't, aren't allowed to leave their homes. Um, if we end up with something like that, we may have to reevaluate it. But my understanding is, is our program can continue to operate uh, in, in the red tier. And if we, if the program decided to expand to other residents in the county and not just for SoCal Union, would that be an option um, in the tier we're in? I think technically it would be an option in the tier we're in. And, and uh, I don't know if Nikki is on the call. So Nikki, if you're here, you, 
feel free to wave and uh, I can make sure that I'm answering these questions correctly. I think our challenge, quite frankly, is staffing the program and having the available space. So in terms of an expansion, um, I don't know that that's in the cards in the near term. I know that we have had to actually contract one of the pods um, because of staffing challenges. So I, I don't think at this point where we are today that we have the capacity to grow it. Uh, we could look at that in the future, maybe as we moved into the winter, but uh, between now and Christmas, I don't think we can grow it. Okay, so the need for child care for the program is still there. However, we don't, we can't staff it. Is that what I'm hearing you say? So, Nikki, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Why don't you take a stab at this? Because I will probably screw it up. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor, Council Members. Um, so yeah, the, we, we could potentially, with available staffing resources, we do have the space in order to um, expand again. Uh, currently, with the exception of one group, uh, which is our middle school group, we're full. And um, our partnership with the county at the moment has asked us to reserve those spaces for participants in CalWORKs um, as they're getting a lot of CalWORKs referrals at the moment. And with those CalWORKs referrals, we could potentially accept um, individuals out of the school district. However, we have made it clear that our preference would be to stay within the school district. Um, and otherwise, as far as any other expansion, it will depend upon uh, expanding our available staff resources and have the challenge of the holidays preventing that at the moment. Thank you, that answers my question. All right, any other council questions? Seeing none, we will bring it to public comment and I will turn it over to our moderator to see if there's any comments on this item. Mayor Peterson, I do not see any attendees with comments, and I do not see any emails. All right, thank you. Uh, with that, we will go to our final item this evening. Uh, consider, uh, I, excuse me, item 9C, consider a resolution establishing holidays and city hall closures for 2021, and I will turn it over to staff. Yeah, just, I want, do we need to take action on the previous oh. item? My apologies. I just wanted to check, make sure we move it on. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, I believe we do. We need to make a determination, correct? Yes, this is Chloe. Um, that is correct. So that is technically yeah. a vote. Okay. I'll move step up the day. Thank you. I'll second. All right, we have a motion by Council Member Story and a second by Council Member Bosser. Uh, can I have a roll call vote, please? Yes, Council Member Bertrand. I agree. Council Member Bator. Aye. Council Member Story. Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. And Mayor Peterson. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Council Member Story. I was trying to jump the gun there and get, get through the agenda before it was time. So let's, now is the appropriate time to move on uh, to, to our next item. Let me get back to the agenda here. Uh, item 9C, consider a resolution establishing holidays and city hall closures for 2021. Yes, thank you, Mayor Peterson. I have a very brief presentation. Can you all hear me? Okay, it's nice to see all of you now that I'm joining on Zoom. Just wanted to say that as well. So, let me share my screen, excuse me. kind of a couple different hats here. So thank you for being patient. And okay, thank you. So 2021 holidays and city hall closures. I don't think I have to belabor the point that we could all use a vacation from 2020. So we're looking forward to 2021. Um, this is pretty basic. It's, to my understanding, what, what is done mostly every year. 
The holidays that the city of Capitola follows is designated in our MOUs, our with agreements with employees, and it designates the, the names and days of the holiday and aligns our holidays with the federal holidays coming down from the United States government. The one um, specific point is that if a holiday falls on a Saturday, we observe that on the Friday before, whereas if a holiday falls on a Sunday, we observe it the Monday after. So you'll see here this list of the, tw this is an example in the MOU, and here is a list of the 2021 holiday closures for City Hall. In red, you'll see just two um, quick changes than what was in your packet. I apologize, there's a typo. Uh, Monday, July 5th will be our observed Independence Day holiday. And you'll notice because New Year's Day falls on a Saturday in 2021, we will be observing it the Friday before on New Year's Eve, December 31st. So, with that, I'm available for any questions. All right. Uh, are there any questions from council? No questions? All right. Uh, with that, we'll bring it to public comment. Are there any comments on this item? Um, I don't see any comment. Larry, can you confirm we didn't receive any um, email comment or anything like that? Yes, I, I'm sorry, uh, Mayor Peterson. Um, I do not see any hands up and I do not see any emails on this item. All right, great. We will come back to council. Um, I see council member Story has his hand up. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I don't have the issue with the particular listed holiday, but um, I did want to maybe bring up a discussion about Columbus Day. Okay. Um, you know, I remember, um, you know, many years ago, Councilman um, um, Morton used to every every year bring up the issue of that 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 was referred to as Columbus Day. Um, and he felt, I, and I think he was a man ahead of his time. He never really got any traction with that request. Um, and it has been, you know, and has continued to uh, be recognized as Columbus Day. Um, we're in a different time now. Um, and I'll just, you know, uh, just this past October, uh, Governor Newsom, uh, passed um, uh, an order recognizing that day as Indigenous Persons Day. Um, and I would like to at least initiate the discussion on this council about uh, now officially changing that holiday within the city of Capitola as Indigenous Persons Day instead of Columbus Day. Um, I don't, you know, I, I didn't necessarily want to start a debate about all the reasons why. Um, I think if we know it in our hearts, um, we can do so. Um, and But I would like to put that forth. And um, in moving to accept this list of holidays, that we include a change to recognize October 11th as Indigenous Persons Day instead of Columbus Day. So I would like to make that motion. I'll second, I'll second that. And that was going to be my comment too, you know, when I was looking over the agenda. And uh, if Yvette seconded it for me, I have no problem with that, but that was definitely going to be my my position too. So I'll accept Yvette being the second on that. Who knows? <laughs> Thank you for your comments. Yes, council member Story, you beat me to it also. So I think uh, it, it's a, a great idea. So we have a motion by Council Member Story and a second by Vice Mayor Brooks. I see uh, Council Member Vautorf also has his hand raised on this item. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, what, I wasn't going to try to beat any of you to that question, just in case you were wondering. Um, and I, I, I'd like to have a, you know, to me, it, it, I understand the point that uh, Council Member Story makes. Uh, there's a lot of discussion on this topic. And uh, here, here's my take on this. Um, you know, we, we, 
there's a, a list of a, a finite list of holidays that we celebrate every year. And and where I can see that there might be a problem acknowledging Christopher Columbus, and there's a dispute about his qualifications to uh, to merit a holiday. Um, I'm kind of a, a conservative when it comes to our history and how we tamper with that. Uh, I think that my main concern here is is I don't feel so moved by acknowledging, even though the, uh, Governor Newsom has already done it, I, I don't want to belittle his authority, but I don't know that this is the right title for what we should be seeking. I, uh, I feel that if, if we're going to have a holiday, first of all, I, I want to preface this by I've always admired that for eight years, I've never had to make a vote on what I consider a nationwide issue, okay? Uh, we've never taken a vote to be a nuclear-free city, and we uh, did not vote, I believe, on the Paris Climate Accord. Uh, we've avoided a lot of controversy, and, and I do appreciate that, but, you know, I think, as the mayor mentioned, these are changing times. I, my concern here is that where I can see that, that maybe Christopher Columbus is not warranted to have a holiday, I want to look at this. I, I, I look back at the last holiday change that I'm aware of, and I, somebody could correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the last one that we changed was Martin Luther King Day. And I believe that that, that was an excellent choice. I think one of the biggest problems that I think we face in our nation is racism. And the acknowledgement of Martin Luther King Day as a holiday, to me, symbolized uh, a, a person that was making a genuine, peaceful effort to stop racism and acknowledging that sends a message that I think rings true with all of us. I, uh, I in this case here, I, I'm not sure that uh, that indigenous people is the direction that a holiday should go. I I I don't feel strong enough about it to say that that's what I want to commit to. One point of, of contention I should I should make to you is if I look at our nation and I look at the people that that have changed the direction of our nation. I could simply say on one hand, I, I don't think we've ever acknowledged the role of a female in changing our nation. And if I was going to be looking at someone to dedicate a holiday to, I, I would prefer to look down that path or some other path that I felt resonated with what I considered most of Americans. And I, I know that personally, I've had conversations with American Indians that don't feel that uh, indigenous is a day that they actually connect with. So it, it's hard for me as a single person in a small town to go against the trend of, of holiday change across the state, especially when our, our governor has, has dedicated this. But I, I just want you to know that, that my feelings here are, it's, I think it's a big deal. I wish there was more effort put into to, to making, I wish I felt that the date resonated as much as I did feel when we changed Martin Luther King Day. So uh, if, if I don't vote unanimous with you, I just want you to understand that there's, there's a little reason behind that. So thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Councilmember Bossor. Uh, Councilmember Bertrand, is that, I, I'm, I'm, my apologies, did you have your hand up previously or is this new? No, uh, this is not new. Um, the reason why um, I thought about bringing this subject up is that to me it's a recognition of the importance that the indigenous people have to the history of this country. I think it's also to me a recognition of the fact that we're looking more and more towards indigenous people for guidance on many different issues. Uh, one that's recently come up is how to manage forests. But in many discussions that I've had and, you know, online now, <laughs> it's amazing how often the Indian community is now being sought after for their input. And so I would like to vote for this because I appreciate the fact that we still have an indigenous community in the United States, and I think their importance is going to be greater as years go by. Thank you, Councilmember Bertrand. Councilmember Story? Well, uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to respond to Ed and uh, and thank him for his comments, his point of view. I respect it uh, fully. Um, 
you know, there, there were many years on the council when um, uh, council member Norton brought up this question um, and I didn't support it. And, and I haven't, um, you know, I think until this point. Um, and, and I think that that's wonderful if we want to maybe consider some other appropriate um, um, group of people that maybe have had an impact uh, on our society. Um, but, you know, this one, uh, this particular date, I think is closely uh, connected to, you know, the indigenous uh, people. Um, and it's one that I think has uh, been already officially acknowledged on the state level. And, and I don't know that we should always wait until our national leaders uh, take action before we feel uh, that we can move forward. Sometimes it takes uh, communities um, and, and people at the local level to make the national changes. Um, so I, I just wanted, but I wanted to acknowledge uh, Ed's point of view. I shared it, I think, for all my life until this point. Um, and, and I respect it. Um, so thank you, Ed. Thank you, Council Member Story. Uh, I also acknowledge and appreciate Council Member Botra's comments on this, especially, um, you know, mentioning that, that there is a need for, for the representation of women in the holidays that we celebrate. I very much appreciate that. Um, with that, we do have a motion and a second. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilmember Bertrand, did you have additional comments? Oh, no, I'm trying to get off of here. <laughs> no more comments for me. Okay. Well, with that, uh, we have a, um, no, I'm sorry. Did we take this to public comment yet? I don't think we have. No, not yet. Okay, thank you. It's, it's after nine, it's past my, I'm in my 30s now, so it's past my bedtime. Um, I will bring this now to public comment. Uh, is there any member of the public that would like to address the council on this item? Um, I do not see anyone with their hands up and any attendees, and I do not see any emails. All right. And with that, we'll bring it back to council. Um, and we have a motion and a second. Uh, can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Council member Bertrand. I agree. Council member Bottorp. No. Council member Story. Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. And Mayor Peterson. Aye. Thank I you. think someone should phone Dennis Norton, tell him what happened. We'll make sure he knows. Uh, motion carries uh, four to one, thank you. Uh, that brings us to uh, the end of tonight's agenda. Uh, it's been an, an interesting meeting. Thank you all so much for your, for your time uh, this evening. It is my last time uh, closing out a meeting as your, as your mayor. I have one more to start, to start the meeting. This is my last time closing out a meeting as, as mayor because the next meeting we're gonna have a transition of our, of our council and a, a new council members and, and a new mayor and, right? Am I wrong? No, nope, you're wrong. I think we have a meeting on the 20, 22nd. Yes, Oh, we correct. do? <laughs> you're not done. Oh boy. I thought we were done. No, no. pass it off to you. Is that that soon? <laughs> Okay. So I can. Well, you said something Ed, earlier, so I thought that's one more full meeting. One more full meeting. One more full meeting. Call to order here. The twenty second is a Sunday. Correct. What, what is the date? Mayor, may I interrupt? It's just the twenty fourth. Oh, that's right. That's right. Okay. Well, sorry, you guys, you're stuck with me for another meeting. So. I'll see you then. <laughs> Mayor you better Peterson. cancel your, your appointments that day then. Mayor Peterson, we'll have to wear the matching jackets then at that other yeah. meeting. I'll give you a call. All right. All right. <laughs> well, see you all on the 24th then. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. And meeting is adjourned. <laughs>